Hello, my name is Jennifer Glass, or Methanogen, as I'm known by my Twitter handle. I'm honored to give this talk, From Tweeds to Tweets, Democratizing and Diversifying the Ivory Tower and Science Communication Through Social Media, highlighting my journey as a scientist active on Twitter. I'm talking today about my experience with Twitter because that platform in particular has had the biggest influence on how I see my role as a scientist and a human in society. Over the past six years or so, my experiences on Twitter have changed the way I approach science, teaching, scientific publishing, and broader communication. I hope I can convey a bit of what I learned from my experiences in my talk today. I first set up an account on Twitter back in 2008, but I used it very rarely until 2014. Here is what my Twitter profile looked like six years ago when I began tweeting at conferences. I knew a lot of people couldn't afford the time and the money to attend meetings, so tweeting about the science was a way I could give back by engaging with those outside the conference center. My first impressions of Twitter was that it was much more fast-paced and more sarcastic than Facebook, which was the only other social media platform that I was on. It took some time to get used to, but once I did, I really fell in love with it. Twitter also really saved me from loneliness and isolation in my pre-tenure years. Here is what my Twitter profile looks like today. As you can see, I've gotten bolder about stating my opinions. It's really become my space to express myself as a person and as a scientist. I've removed any mention of my institution from my profile because I'm expressing my own opinions, not those of my university. There were two things that kept me coming back to Twitter. First, the community. There is an amazing community of supportive friends on Twitter who have each other's backs. Of course, we all know about the dark side of Twitter, the bullies and trolls, and I'm happy to answer questions in the panel about how to deal with harassers. I have met so many amazing people from around the world on Twitter, and I've learned so much from them. Just a few of my favorite accounts are shown here. I'll highlight more of my favorite Twitter accounts throughout the rest of this talk. Second, tweeting has made me a better scientist and a better writer. Having a strict word limit for each tweet helps me to distill my scientific writing to the simplest form. This has been helpful for tweeting, but also for talks and papers. For example, here's a slide from one of my science talks. It shows some geochemical profiles and microbial taxonomy with depth down a sediment core. What should the title of this slide be? Before I began tweeting, I would have titled the slide something vague and descriptive, like results, sediment microbial diversity from 16S rRNA sequencing. After I began tweeting, I changed my approach to titles in general. Whenever possible now, I use short, crisp, declarative titles, such as Atribacteria Dominate Gas Hydrate Stability Zone, that make the point and contain keywords for which people are searching. This helps people follow along and saves them time and effort. In the remainder of this talk, I will highlight four main lessons I took away from my experience on Twitter. First, aim to educate. Second, tell the story behind the science. Third, set the record straight. And four, especially for senior scientists, promote others. The world is hungry for truth, logic, and facts presented with humor and positivity. Twitter is a great place for science communication. An example of a scientist on Twitter who does a beautiful job communicating to those outside his own field is virologist Dr. Efra Rivera Serrano. His Twitter handle is at Naked Capsid. Here is one tweet from a recent thread of his, each with a slide highlighting a different study on SARS-CoV-2. 
In this slide, he does a fantastic job of breaking down the key findings of each paper. He makes it approachable with nice organization and graphics. He's basically offering a free lecture to his Twitter followers. This is a really fantastic use of Twitter as a science communication platform that is free and open to anyone who wishes to visit. Something special that Twitter offers is a platform to tell stories and share photos that tell the story behind the science. Here is a tweet from James Elzer at Dr. Limnology that describes the backstory behind his group's recent paper in eLife, which reports the effects of whole ecosystem nutrient additions on microbial information processing in an extremely phosphate-starved ecosystem, Cuatro Cienegas, Mexico. This tweet thread describes the adventures the team had getting rental cars and equipment to the remote site their favorite field foods, and also gives shout outs to essential collaborators. It gives a much more human angle to the science. A third use for Twitter that I've increasingly found to be important is setting the record straight about hidden figures behind scientific discoveries. The term hidden figure was popularized by the 2017 movie by the same name about the lives of Katherine Johnson, Dorothy Vaughn, and Mary Jackson, three African-American women who performed the key orbital calculations that allowed NASA to launch the first U.S. astronauts into orbit. There are many such hidden figures in science, including in geochemistry. I'll highlight three such women who I've tweeted about and whose discoveries likely impacted some aspect of your life in science, but who you may not have heard about before. At the same time that Katherine Johnson was making those computations for NASA, Japanese scientist Katsuko Saryuhashi was making key calculations allowing scientists to model complicated marine carbonate chemistry before computers were available. She also performed research on the effects of the radioactive fallout from US nuclear testing in the Bikini Atoll, which ultimately provided justification for the prohibition of above ground nuclear testing. She was a strong advocate for women who followed in her footsteps. She founded the Society of Japanese Women Scientists in 1958. She also established a prize awarded annually to a female scientist who serves as a role model for younger women scientists. Fast forward 20 years, Theresa Stedman was working in a special laboratory in Bethesda, Maryland that NIH built for her research. This one of a kind laboratory was like a gigantic anoxic glove box filled with nitrogen and hydrogen that allowed researchers to actually enter wearing respirators. This amazing laboratory enabled Thressa to discover the 21st amino acid, selenocysteine, which she reported in a single authored science paper in 1974. At the same time that Thressa Stedman was discovering selenium's role in life, Kathleen Crane, then a graduate student at Scripps Institute of Oceanography, was playing a pivotal role in the discovery of hydrothermal vents on the seafloor. Although credit for the discovery is often given to her male collaborators, it was Kathleen Crane whose temperature monitoring system detected a 0.1 degree anomaly along the Galapagos Rift in 1976, and who deployed transponders near the vents which enabled a larger team to return the following year with the Alvin submersible. The fourth lesson I learned, especially as I progressed further in my career, is the importance of using Twitter to promote the work of others. An excellent example of someone who promoted others until her last days was Louise Kellogg, who left us last April far too early. Louise was a professor at UC Davis who is remembered by our community for her outstanding contributions to geophysics, as well as her support and mentorship of colleagues, particularly women scientists. 
Louise's final tweet from just a few days before she passed away was congratulations to her colleague Isabel Montañez for receiving the 2019 Lamarck Medal from the European Geosciences Union for her contributions to sedimentary geochemistry and paleoclimate. In the spirit of Louise, Thressa, and Kotzko, Twitter can be a great place to recognize scientists whose work is not given adequate credit in our community. For example, after hearing one too many talks on the origin of life that only acknowledge male scientists, I created this slide showing some of the many women working in the field of origin of life research to encourage more conference, workshop, and seminar organizers to invite them for seminars. Similarly, Georgia Tech PhD candidate Minda Montegudo and I have compiled a database of databases of scientists from underrepresented groups, including a database of geoscientists of color, for conference organizers to quickly find speakers for their events and potential new collaborators. If you're interested in our database, you can access it from the inclusion page on my website and it's also the pinned tweet on my Twitter profile. Thank you for listening. Thank you to the organizers of this session. And I look forward to answering your questions and to seeing you online for the panel during virtual Goldschmidt.